Okay, so let's go over the lecture and then we'll talk about all that stuff. Um, at the end. So this is the outline for my lecture today, and it's a lot of data, surprisingly for lung, um, but there's incredible movement and momentum right now in personalized medicine and lung cancer. Now the first section we're going to go over is frontline and maintenance, and this is stuff that you probably are already very familiar with, but because it was, you know, sort of very uh, significantly highlighted in the lung oral session, we'll go over that very quickly, and that's the Paramount trial, and then the PS2 phase 3 study from South America. Then we're going to focus in on on the mutant populations and what we're, what's developing in those. We'll talk about EGFR mutants, KRAS mutants, EML4-ALK, and at the very end we'll go over small cell lung cancer. So lots of data. Um, you'll have my slides at the end of the session because I'm going to have to talk really fast. Okay, so first study we're going to go over is the PS2 population, phase 3 trial, and this was basically chemo-naive patients had to have an ECOG PS of two, measurable disease, and they were stratified one-to-one -to, -one to pemetrexid monotherapy versus a platinum doublet with carbopemetrexid. Their primary endpoint was overall survival. And they basically gave the patients about four cycles of therapy. They didn't do maintenance on this trial. And this was a very large South American study throughout eight centers in Brazil, as well as one center in the US. The patient characteristics were fairly well balanced between the two arms, and compliance data indicated that actually there were more patients that completed the platinum doublet as opposed to the pemetrexid monotherapy. A little surprising. Um, in terms of toxicity, obviously you're going to get a little bit more anemia. Um, I would have anticipated more myelosuppression um, with the carbopemetrexid versus the PEM monotherapy. When you look at the data, obviously the response rate favored the platinum doublet. Um, not surprising, we've seen that in some other studies, the French study with carbo weekly paclitaxel being the famous one that was presented at the uh, ASCO uh, plenary session. There also was a favoring towards the platinum doublet with progression-free survival that has a ratio of 0.46, the p-value highly statistically significant, and overall survival was superior with a hazard ratio of 0.57, the p-value statistically significant for the platinum doublet. So when you look at any second-line treatment, you know, it's fairly equivalent between the two arms. So you can't say that, you know, the platinum doublet patients got more treatment, and that's why you got these results. Actually, it does look like platinum doublets for PS2 patients definitely appear to be uh, better than single-agent monotherapy with pemetrexid. So generally, just from this data, I think it adds to the literature. I think for the PS2 patients, with pemetrexid being such a well-tolerated agent, you can use carbopemetrexid for them and get them through. It will improve outcomes for them. There's definitely acceptable toxicity. Um, the only thing I recommend is about a week before you give them the chemotherapy, make sure they get the B12 as well as the folic acid. I find that if you just load them up with the vitamins, they tend to do better. They don't get as much anemia. They don't get as much myalgia. So that's just a little tip. Um, so certainly, PS2 patients, the recommendation certainly would be try to give them carbopemetrexid over PEM monotherapy. You can get them through, and they definitely get clinical outcome benefit. Okay, second trial is the overall survival results from the Paramount Maintenance Study. Now, as all of you recall, this was presented previously at ASCO, and it was basically a maintenance trial of patients who were chemo-naive that got cisplatin pemetrexid for four cycles of therapy and were randomized two to one to pemetrexid maintenance versus placebo maintenance. And there were appropriate stratifications, and their primary endpoint on this trial was looking at the different uh, survival outcomes. The patient characteristics were pretty equivalent between the two arms, and in terms of compliance, there were a lot of patients who were actually able to complete the pemetrexid over six cycles of maintenance therapy. There was a little bit higher discontinuation rate due to adverse events, um, and post-trial therapy was fairly equivalent between the two arms. There were, was a little bit more toxicity with the maintenance pemetrexid as to be expected. It's highlighted here in terms of grade three, four toxicity with fatigue, anemia, and neutropenia. But the bottom line, final overall results um, being presented from time of randomization, pemetrexid maintenance favored um, the progression, uh, sorry, the overall survival from time of randomization, the hazard ratio 0.78, the p-value highly statistically significant. It also was favored for progression-free survival. When you look at overall survival from time of induction therapy, it also was um, superior with the maintenance pemetrexid, the hazard ratio 0.78, the p-value highly statistically significant. When you look at the subgroup analysis from overall survival, it did look that across the board, pretty much every single subgroup did have the benefit favoring pemetrexid. There wasn't anything that stood out as different. 
So patients treated with continuation maintenance therapy who are non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer, have an improved survival with maintenance pemetrexid over placebo. Across the board, all the subgroups appeared to have benefit. Um, the response to induction therapy, most importantly, did not predict for survival outcome. So if you have a patient who gets cis-pem and let's say they get stable disease, they still may get significant benefit um, if you give them the maintenance pemetrexid. Continuation maintenance pemetrexid is definitely accepted now as our standard of care. Um, the NCCN guidelines will probably be revised because right now they're indicating switch maintenance, but now PEM continuation maintenance certainly will be uh, appropriate. Okay, so let's go now into the mutant populations because this is where we're seeing the biggest evolution in lung cancer. And let's first start off with the EGFR mutants. So this is the Lux Lung 3 trial, and it was looking at a drug called Afatinib. Now this is a very important agent. You gotta be aware of this because this will have a role um, in lung cancer in the future, um, and they are seeking FDA approval for this agent. Now Afatinib is unique because it's an irreversible ERB family blocker. It inhibits the ERB family receptor heterodimer and that's how it actually works. There's definitely in vitro activity against the T790 mutation, which as all of you know, is the resistant mutation to erlotinib and gefitinib. So that's why this is an agent that's very uh, of great interest in thoracic oncology. It is an oral agent. And basically, this was the Lux Lung 3 trial. It was a phase three study, and it was looking at lung adenocarcinoma patients who had an EGFR mutation in their tumor. Now, it didn't matter what kind of EGFR mutation they had. Remember, the three most common ones that we've all talked about have been the deletion exon 19 and the L858 mutation. Those are sensitive mutations where if you give them a lot of gefitinib, their tumors melt away everywhere. You know, deletion exon 19, you could have them on for four or five years on the pill with great efficacy. The L858 mutation, you have them on for about a year, they develop resistance. The most common resistance point mutation we've identified is the T790 mutation. It changes one codon, which changes one amino acid, changes one protein, completely alters the binding pocket of the EGFR, so you no longer bind erlotinib and gefitinib. That's why it's a resistance mutation. Now, afatinib is able to to, because of the mechanism of action is different and it's irreversible, it's able, to over, it's able to overcome that T790 mutation. And so that's why um, it's very important in mutations, uh, patients who have EGFR mutations. So any mutation could go on to this trial. Uh, it didn't matter what type of mutation you had. They did stratify, though, by the different mutations, and they also stratified by Asian ethnicity versus non-Asian ethnicity. And they gave them a fat nib at 40 milligrams a day versus cisplatin pemetrexid at the usual standard dosing for up to six cycles of treatment. Their primary endpoint was progression-free survival. Now, this was 133 sites in 25 countries that participated in this trial. The patient characteristics were well balanced between the two arms. In terms of the adverse events and compliance, no significant differences in toxicity. Um, you know, again, obviously, a fatinib has different toxicity profiles compared to chemo, but when you look at the incidence rate of reported grade three, four events and SAEs, it was about roughly the same, about 14%. In terms of median treatment duration, it was longer for the afatinib compared to the chemotherapy. And when you look at the clinical outcomes, again, this is an EGFR mutant population. Any mutation could go on. The overall response rate definitely favored the afatinib, 56% versus chemo, 22%. This was independent radiographic review. And when you look at the common mutations, meaning the sensitive ones that would have responded to erlotinib gefitinib that got afatinib, they had a very high response rate, 61% compared to 22% with chemotherapy. And this was all statistically significant. The progression-free survival favored the afatinib, the hazard ratio of 0.58, the p-value highly statistically significant. When you look at the progression-free survival subgroup analysis across the board, it didn't matter what their clinical characteristics were, everybody had uh, benefit with the afatinib. When you look at the progression-free survival for the common mutations, the L858 and the EGF deletion exon 19, they had a significant progression-free survival benefit, the hazard ratio 0.47, the p-value statistically significant. Their median progression-free survival, 13.6 months. I mean, for a lung cancer stage four patient, you know, who doesn't have a mutation, that's their usual overall survival. And so with the afatinib, for these common mutations, you can basically give them a progression-free survival that's quite significant. 
And when you compare that to progression-free survival with chemo alone in the same population, it was seven months, roughly. When they look at quality of life analysis across the board, and we see this consistently across all the lung cancer trials, the pills always have a better quality of life reporting from the patients, and that was across the board. So frontline of fatinib improves the quality of life, response rate, disease control rate, and median progression-free survival over chemotherapy, the cisplatin pemetrexid, in both the overall EGFR mutation and also in the sensitive common EGFR mutation patients. The subgroup analysis shows benefit across the board for all clinical characteristics, and there were no new safety signals. Basically, diarrhea and rash were the big um, toxicities reported with the fatinib, as expected. Okay. So let's move on now to the EML4 ALK population, because that's the latest. Um, I'll summarize everything at the end about how, where I see the role of a is going to fit in for the EGFR mutants. But let's begin first with the uh, KRAS mutants, and then we'll go into EML4 ALK patients. So this is, KRAS mutation has sort of been the bane of thoracic oncology. Everybody's always thought it's a negative prognostic factor. And so what they wanted to do is they wanted to look at the adjuvant chemotherapy population of patients, patients who had surgery, and the curable population. And they wanted to see, is KRAS mutation really a, a negative prognostic factor in lung? And then I'm going to show you a trial, um, because everybody's always said KRAS mutants are refractory to chemo. I'm going to show you some promising data with a MEK inhibitor. Um, so we definitely are developing, I think, agents that may target this population very well. Now, KRAS mutations, well, sorry, RAS mutations occur in about 15 to 20 percent of lung cancer. And over 90 percent of them are going to be the KRAS mutation, typically associated with significant smoking histories and also adenocarcinoma. And it was first identified as a negative prognostic marker in 1990. Now, remember, in colorectal cancer and pancreatic cancer, KRAS mutations are very significant. And in colorectal cancer, it's a negative predictive factor for cetuximab. This is not the case in lung cancer. And it's because when you look at the different types of KRAS mutation, it's different between lung cancer and colorectal cancer. And these pie charts are showing the distribution when you look at the actual amino acid change that occurs with the mutation. It's different in lung cancer as opposed to colorectal. And this is for codon 12 mutations, and these are for codon 13 mutations. So that's why we see a difference in treatment outcomes in patients when, you know, previously all the trials suggested in, in colorectal cancer, the CRYSTAL study, that there's no benefit to cetuximab and KRAS mutants. But in lung cancer, the FLEX and BMS-099 trial basically said it doesn't matter whether or not you're a KRAS mutant or not. It doesn't matter what, um, you know, whether you get cetuximab or not. So this is probably why we see a significant difference um, between the KRAS mutation populations. Okay, so this trial was actually pooling a major analysis, the LACE trial. And the LACE meta-analysis was all the major adjuvant trials done in lung cancer. And they grabbed all the tissue from all of those trials. And that was the NIDA, JBR10, ILT, CLGB9633 trial. So they had over 1,500 tissue specimens um, to basically harvest and do the KRAS mutations on it. So what they did is they checked for mutation for codon 12 and codon 13, and they also characterized what the amino acid change was in those patients. And they looked to see, is there any prognostic or predictive value to these patients? Prognostic for, surgery, for benefit from surgery and adjuvant chemo or just surgery alone? And then predictive for, is there a particular mutation in KRAS that told us this patient should get chemo or not? And then they correlated it also to see, does KRAS mutation predict for development of second primary tumors? So the bottom line, and this was just all the different sequencing and all the assays that they did for the different trials. When they looked at the 1,500 uh, patients, they found and identified 300 that had the KRAS mutation. And when you look across the board, the distribution, it was probably about anywhere between 14 to 26 percent of the populations in each of the trials had the KRAS mutation. We roughly say about 20 percent of your adenocarcinomas um, are likely to carry a KRAS mutation. They identified the KRAS mutations to occur more in women, younger patients who are younger than age 55, adenocarcinomas, and actually small primary tumors, T1, T2. There was no association with overall stage, end stage, or PS. Now, the bottom line is that KRAS mutations had no prognostic value whatsoever. They didn't tell you anything about whether a patient was going to survive or have progression-free survival difference. 
when you looked at the codon type, is a codon 12 mutation or codon 13 mutation? Also, not prognostic, didn't matter in these patients. It also was not predictive for any improvement in overall survival with adjuvant chemotherapy. And you can see over here, no difference whatsoever. So why are we talking about this? Well, they actually did find out that if you have a codon 13 KRAS mutation, you might have a worse outcome if you get adjuvant chemotherapy. Now, these are very small numbers, and this has to be validated further. But what they found out is their hazard ratio for death appeared to be um, 5.78, and this was statistically significant, albeit very, very small patients. And so when they actually went and looked further um, to look at, um, oh, sorry, these are the Kaplan-Meier curves. Again, the p-value highly statistically significant. If you have a codon 13 mutation and you get just observation, you do fairly well compared to if you get chemo. So when they looked in at the codon, um, at the different mutations, and then looked at amino acid substitutions, and you these are the different mutations that they looked at for the amino acid substitutions, there appeared to be a bit of a difference um, between some of the different amino acid substitutions. Some actually had a very good response um, in terms of um, prognostic for overall survival, and others did not. Again, these are extremely small numbers, um, but it made waves because it told us that the different KRAS mutations are relevant. And we have to look beyond just saying, oh, there's a mutant in this gene. We have to look at what type of mutation it is. So that was really the main point of this, um, this uh, project. So when they also looked at second primary cancers, the other thing that was very important out of this is that KRAS mutations appear to be predictive that you're going to get a second primary lung cancer. And it was statistically significant. And when they looked at whether or not these patients got chemotherapy, it appears that if you have a KRAS mutation and you get chemotherapy, you appear to actually have less risk for a second primary tumor. So this actually may change things. It may be that if we find out from the surgical specimen they have a particular KRAS mutation and it's not codon 13, we may say this is a patient, regardless of stage, who molecularly is at high risk for a second primary tumor that should probably get chemotherapy. So that's how this may alter our standard of care practice. Molecular um, genotype may factor into our treatment decisions in the adjuvant setting. Again, it does have to be validated. All of these are small numbers, um, and there are studies currently being designed to look at this. So as a general rule, KRAS mutations are not prognostic for resected non-small cell carcinoma. However, when you break it down by codons as well as amino acid substitutions, um, you do find that codon 13 KRAS mutation patients have a worse outcome to adjuvant chemotherapy. And also, the KRAS mutations as a whole may be predictive of development of a second primary tumor. And so there may be a population of patients um, who should be getting adjuvant chemotherapy in order to prevent them from getting second primary tumors. Again, all of this is, needs to be validated, but this is what this project has done. It's basically potentially going to reshape how we do uh, treatment in the future. Everything is going to be related to molecular genotype as well as stage. Okay, so what about the stage four KRAS mutants? What should we do for them? Um, because they are definitely a population of patients that are tough to treat and tend to be refractory to a lot of our current agents. So selumetinib is actually a potent uh, inhibitor of MEK1 and 2, and it actually has activity in BRAF and RAS mutant cell lines. And so this was a phase two trial in salvage therapy, so patients had to have failed frontline treatment. They had to have a confirmed KRAS mutation, and it didn't matter. They did not select for KRAS mutant type, although they do have that data, but they didn't select for it. You can enroll any patient with a KRAS mutation on here. And they gave them docetaxel at the typical dosing, standard 75 milligrams every three weeks, to the docetaxel plus the selumetinib. And their primary endpoint on this trial was overall survival. The two arms were well balanced between patient characteristics. And in terms of compliance, there was no significant difference. There was actually a little bit higher um, number of docetaxel cycles given in the combination arm. What they found out, though, and this is why I'm presenting this, is the response rate was quite significantly different. The response rate in the salvage setting in patients who are KRAS mutants who've already failed frontline chemo was extremely high, 37% with a combination of docetaxel plus the MEK inhibitor. 
And when you look at those who were alive in progression-free survival at six months, 37%. And you compare this to salvage dose of Taxol alone, 0% response rate and 16% progression-free survival. Again, highly statistically significant. So when we look at toxicity profile, the MEK inhibitors are toxic. Um, they are going to have a different toxicity profile. The most common things that you find for grade three, four toxicity are rash, asthenia, neutropenia, febrile neutropenia, when you combine it with the dose of taxol. So there was a little higher SAE, 59% compared to 31% with docetaxel alone. 47% of patients did have an adverse event requiring hospitalization um, compared to 19% with chemo alone. And then there were dose reductions and dose interruptions in the combination arm that were quite high compared to the single agent docetaxel. So along with the efficacy, we are seeing more toxicity with this combination. When we look at the progression-free survival, though, it highly favored the combination, the hazard ratio 0.58, the p-value highly statistically significant, and overall survival. The hazard ratio was 0.8. The p-value, though, did not reach statistical significance, but when you look at the median overall survival, the median was for the combination 9.4 months compared to docetaxel alone, which was 5.2 months, so a, a four-month, 4.2-month median overall survival benefit in the salvage setting of patients. So this was the first prospective study in KRAS mutant non-muscle lung cancer that showed a clinical benefit with a combination regimen. The selumetinib at 75 milligrams BID plus the docetaxel at 75 milligrams per meter squared every three weeks improved the response rate, and I didn't show this data, but it changed the tumor size. Um, there were a lot of patients categorized as stable disease, but they had shrinkage of their tumor. Um, the progression-free survival also was statistically significantly favoring the combination of docetaxel alone. We had a 4.2-month median overall survival benefit, but it did not reach statistical significance. The toxicity was acceptable, and they are definitely doing additional studies of MEK inhibition in the KRAS mutant population. They are also going to be looking at the amino acid substitutions and the different types of KRAS mutations, so we'll see an update from that. And we may find that the MEK inhibitors plus docetaxel work better in a particular type of KRAS mutation. So that data is still uh, forthcoming, and so we'll see. Okay, let's talk about the next category of patients, the EML4 ALK patients. So we're going to first talk about resistance mechanisms, and then I'm going to show you some new data on a new novel agent, LDK378. So EML4 ALK, as everybody knows, is a fusion translocation. Um, this is e echinoderm mycotubule associated protein like 4 and anaplastic lymphoma kinase. It's found primarily in the adenocarcinoma population in patients who are never or light former smokers. They are routinely almost always EGFR KRAS wild type and younger. Now, across the board in all adenocarcinomas, when you look, they're about 9% of the population. If you are having a patient who's EGFR wild type, who's a Caucasian never smoker with adeno, they've got a 10 to 20% likelihood that they're gonna be EML4 ALK uh, translocated. They are a very distinct entity among the lung adenocarcinomas. They do not respond to the EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors. They will have no response at all. They also are a negative prognostic factor. They don't respond as well to chemotherapy either. There was a data presented last year at ASCO showing that ALK-positive patients who were treated with second-line, third-line crizotinib had a markedly improved overall survival than those patients who never get the crizotinib. And so very critical to identify these patients and get them crizotinib as soon as possible. Now, well, the problem, of course, is what happens when these patients begin to develop resistance to the crizotinib? There are a few patients who have been on the crizotinib for a couple of years, some longer, um, who have eventually developed uh, crizotinib resistance. So this was a study looking at those initial um, patients who developed refractory disease. And they had about 19 patients that they repeated their biopsies after progression on the, on the uh, crizotinib. Now, two patients had what they identified as primary resistance, meaning they got the crizotinib and they never responded. And then they had about 17 that were on the crizotinib for a while and then developed resistance. And they basically got about 16 patients who had successful rebiopsies that they were able to look at mutation analysis in the ALK kinase region. They also looked at copy number analysis by fluorescence in situ hybridization. So they looked at how many copies of the ALK gene um, were present. They also sequenced the patients for EGFR and KRAS mutation again. And so what they were looking for, obviously, is what was the mechanism of resistance in these patients? And what they identified is that 
had an ALK kinase mutation. And about 19% had ALK gene fusion copy number gain, meaning they had additional copies of the ALK gene that had developed in the interval time. 31% developed subsequent different oncogenic drivers, and that's for the EGFR and KRAS mutations. And 19%, or three of the patients, had unknown mechanisms. So they're classifying these now by ALK non-dominant versus ALK dominant, meaning that the patients who have resistance still utilize the ALK pathway and then there's other patients that are utilizing um, non-ALK pathways. And the reason why that's significant, I'm going to show you in the next abstract. Um, but eventually, everybody, once they develop progression in lung cancer, is going to need to get rebiopsied. And we'll be, again, targeting whatever oncogenic driver they have that caused the development of the progression. So this study was very important in identifying that rebiopsy of these growing tumor lesions is very useful. They've now classified new terminology where resistance mechanisms for EML4 ALK are ALK dominant versus ALK non-dominant. Um, and certainly, and this is very relevant because of this next abstract. So normally, I never would show you a phase one trial, but you want to watch out for this, uh, red, uh, this uh, agent, LDK378. This is an ALK inhibitor. It's an oral agent, and it's an actually an ATP competitive inhibitor of ALK. So this uh, study was actually a phase one, and it basically allowed any ALK positive cancer, so any solid tumor or liquid tumor that was ALK positive. But they specifically were looking for lung cancer ALK positive patients who were resistant to a prior ALK inhibitor, namely crizotinib. And then they were looking also stratifying by ALK positive lung cancer naive to prior ALK inhibitors. And this was continuous dosing of the oral agent. And again, it's a phase one, so they're looking at MTD. So, they had 56 patients on this trial, and about 50 of them were lung cancer patients. And 37 of them had prior crizotinib, and 19 had, were naive to crizotinib. And the bottom line was their MTD was 750 milligrams. Six patients had the DLT, and it was typically hypophosphatemia, ALT elevation, nausea, dehydration, diarrhea, vomiting. Um, the most common were GI and fatigue. Two of the patients had to be discontinued for, from treatment due to adverse events, and all of the adverse events were reversible after you stopped the um, ALK inhibitor. Now, why am I showing this to you? Well, the response rate, again, in the patients who had lung cancer, who had previously failed crizotinib, was 81% with this drug. And so, very significant. Um, they had to be treated at greater than or equal to 400 milligrams of the dosing, um, but again, 21 out of the 26 patients who had already failed crizotinib had a beautiful response to treatment. And these are just some examples. You can see here, this was the um, ALK patient that after six weeks on the LDK378, nice clearance of their tumor. This patient over here, look at that, very, very nice. And the other thing that was very significant was it appears across the blood-brain barrier. This is a patient who has a baseline tumor, started on trial six weeks of the drug, and they get clearance of the brain met. So very important drug, LDK378. Um, watch out for it because this may be very relevant in the patients who have ALK um, positive disease who fail crizotinib, um, who have an ALK dominant mutation. This agent may be very important uh, to get that onto them. It's also active in patients with brain mets. Okay. Last section, we're going to turn now to small cell lung cancer. We're going to first talk about limited disease, and we're going to talk about a timing trial of chemotherapy plus concurrent chemo, uh, radiation. And then the last one is going to be looking at a phase three trial out of Japan in the extensive stage setting with amrubicin, because that was sort of like a hot drug for small cell lung cancer uh, a couple of years ago. But first, we're going to look at the timing trial. Now, this was a phase three trial in limited stage small cell lung cancer, and they were basically asking the question, does it matter when we treat concurrent chemoradiation, giving cisplatin etoposide during cycle one versus waiting um, for the radiation, giving your chemotherapy, and at cycle three, adding in the radiation? Is there any difference? Do we jeopardize the patients uh, in any way? And oftentimes, you see this because a lot of times some patients um, can't get into radiation that quickly, but you know, as you know, small cells are very aggressive, and so you just have to bite the bullet and give them that chemo first. Um, and oftentimes, you you get them through two cycles of therapy before they even, you know, can get 
their simulation done for radiation oncology. So this trial was designed with that in mind to ask that question. The primary endpoint was complete response rate. They had 219 patients that went on to the trial. These were fairly standard uh, dosing for chemotherapy. Very, uh, it, you could do this. Um, I like to actually give cisplatin 60 and then 120 of a toposide, but, but this is totally appropriate. Um, and the radiation, and they also did give prophylactic cranial radiation in the patients who had a PR or CR. So the two arms were fairly well balanced across the initial arm versus the delayed arm. There was no difference in response rate or progression-free survival between the two arms. And when you looked at overall survival, there was no difference whatsoever in the initial arm versus the delayed arm. So the only thing that they found was a difference in toxicity. So if you actually give chemo cycle one and add in the radiation cycle one, you actually get more febrile neutropenia as opposed to waiting to cycle three to start the radiation treatment. So that was the main difference between the two arms. So limited stage small cell carcinoma, very appropriate to wait to cycle three um, to add in the radiation to the chemo. Um, Actually, it may be better for certain patients because you do see a higher incidence of febrile neutropenia if you start off with cycle one uh, concurrent chemo radiation with the chemo. So just use your judgment on the patients in terms of whether or not you should start on cycle one. If they're very robust and you just want to get them through treatment, that's totally appropriate. There's no difference at all in clinical outcomes. But if there's somebody that you just got to start chemo with because the radiation is going to be delayed or they have extremely bulky tumor, you want to try to bulk reduce it, very appropriate to wait till cycle three to add in the radiation, not a big deal whatsoever. Okay, so last abstract for lung is gonna be the phase three small cell lung cancer extensive stage. And this is JCOG 0509, and this was done in Japan. Now, as you know, in Japan, they were utilizing renotecan and cisplatin. They don't use toposide, and that's because their trials, for whatever reason, in the ethnic population of the Japanese patient, they do much better with the renotecan as opposed to the cisplatin and toposide. The problem is, though, they get terrible diarrhea um, because of their pharmacogenomics. And so they were trying to get this drug, amrubicin, which is basically a topoisomerase 2 inhibitor similar to topotecan. And they were thinking that this might have significant efficacy. And it's actually approved for use in the salvage setting for them in Japan and it doesn't give them diarrhea. So they were trying to move it up front line to say this may be a new standard of care approach where we could get the same efficacy and not have the diarrhea. So this was a one-to-one -one comparison of 282 patients of cisarinotecan versus cisamrubicin, and then they got prophylactic cranial radiation for patients that had a CR. So we'll refer to the trials as IP for renotecan cisplatin and AP for amrubicin cisplatin. The primary endpoint was overall survival. Now, there was more toxicity in the amrubicin cisplatin arm, um, significantly higher than in the renotecan platinum, and it had to do with myelosuppression, febrile neutropenia. Um, they also had a lot of anemia and thrombocytopenia. In fact, halfway through the trial, they actually had to dose reduce the amrubicin because the patients were having so much trouble with infections and febrile neutropenia. Now, the renotecan platinum arm only had a 7% uh, grade 3 4 toxicity uh, with the diarrhea. But everything else was markedly less than the amrubicin platinum. There was no difference whatsoever between the two arms for response rate, progression-free survival, or quality of life. But when you look at the progression-free survival, albeit not statistically significant, this starts to become a little concerning. The amrubicin platinum arm actually had a worse progression-free survival than the renotecan platinum arm. And when you look at overall survival, AP had a worse overall survival than arenotecan platinum, the hazard ratio 1.41. So this was very concerning um, because this was also something that was un unanticipated um, because this was already an approved agent for them. So basically, AP causes more febrile neutropenia, um, whereas renotecan platinum, you do tend to get 7% grade 3, 4 diarrhea in the Japanese population. AP certainly did not improve um, anything over renotecan platinum. In fact, had a worse overall survival, which was a surprise. Um, so right now, renotecan platinum still remains the standard of care for your Japanese patients for small cell lung cancer. Okay, so let me try to summarize and conclude the whole lung cancer section. So in the frontline setting and in maintenance, in PS2 patients, platinum pemetrexid improves outcomes over pemetrexid monotherapy. You really can get this into your PS2 patients, so I highly recommend you try the platinum doublet. And given the tolerability, this should be your first treatment plan for your PS2 patient. 
Continuation maintenance with pemetrexid is definitely now an accepted practice. Um, we are awaiting the point break trial, which is um, the platinum pemetrexid bevacizumab followed by pemetrexid bevacizumab maintenance compared to the E4599 regimen, which is the carbopaclitaxel bev followed by bev maintenance. That trial has completed accrual. We are waiting for the results. Um, the platinum pemetrexid bevacizumab is something that I do off study as frontline for my adenocarcinoma patients um, because it's very well tolerated. I think it's very efficacious. We're all expecting the trial to show equivalent survival and less toxicity than the E4599 regimen, but we may actually see improvement in outcomes. I don't know yet, um, but that's what we're anticipating. So watch out for the point break trial. That's going to be very important. It may change our standard practice in the frontline setting to recommend platinum pemetrexid bevacizumab followed by PEMBEV maintenance um, in that population. For the EGFR mutants, afatinib and irreversible oral EGFR TKI has consistent clinical benefit over frontline chemo in the EGFR mutant population. Subgroup analysis shows benefit across most subgroups in both in the overall mutant population and in your specific sensitive EGFR mutants as well. Afatinib will definitely have a role in this population of patients, but the timing still remains unclear. So I don't know in the future if we're going to say you should be giving erlotinib first in your sensitive EGFR mutants, and then when they develop resistance, do they fatten them? Or we'll just say, go ahead and use the big gun, a fatinib up front. The timing all remains unclear. That'll have to be studied in prospective studies, um, and so we're waiting on that. In terms of the KRAS mutants, very important to know, there are different KRAS mutations. Um, the codon 13 mutants have a worse survival with adjuvant chemotherapy in your surgically resected population. Overall, KRAS mutants aren't prognostic for overall survival or predictive for adjuvant chemotherapy in this population of patients, but it's important to remember that it could potentially um, reduce, if you give adjuvant chemo to certain KRAS mutants, you may reduce their risk of developing a second primary tumor. Again, all has to be validated, but watch out for that data in the future. MEK inhibition in combination with chemo is a promising target for, MEC, uh, for KRAS mutations, and that is being studied further in larger trials. In the EML4 ALK population, both ALK dominant and non dominant mutations of resistance have been identified in this population of patients who have failed crizotinib therapy. Very critical to identify these patients early, get crizotinib into them. New agents such as LDK378 look very promising in your ALK refractory, um, Al sorry, crizotinib refractory ALK positive patients. And certainly some of the other agents being looked at in that population are the HSP90 inhibitors. And so important to remember uh, to watch out for those too. The other thing I didn't have time to go over is the ROS1 mutated patients. Crizotinib not only targets ALK, but it also targets ROS1. And we have identified about a 2% incidence in the adenocarcinoma population. These patients will have ROS1 mutants. They get complete dissolving of their tumor with crizotinib. And if you have a patient that you've identified a ROS1 mutation in, you gotta get them crizotinib. It works just the same as if they have an ALK mutant. So important to know. There's also a few trials if you can't get the crizotinib paid for for whatever reason. There are several trials ongoing in the United States for ROS1 mutants with crizotinib that you could get them onto that study. Okay, small cell lung cancer, limited stage, it's A-OK -okay to give the radiation during cycle three of your cisplatin etoposide. Um, in fact, you'd reduce the rate of febrile neutropenia. And in an extensive stage, amrubicin is definitely out um, for frontline therapy. Um, we don't have it approved here for salvage treatment, but in Japan and in some places in Europe, they do have it approved in salvage setting for amrubicin. Okay, so the last thing I'll do is leave you with my treatment algorithm for what I do with a patient who comes in with lung cancer, if there's squamous cell in the frontline setting, you avoid pemetrexid or bevacizumab. Um, you can give them second line EGFR TKI or maintenance or lotinib. I usually do cisplatin dose of taxol for four cycles of therapy and then switch maintenance to or lotinib for my squamous cells. If they're non-squamous cell and they're neuroendocrine, the best thing I find so far is just the platinum toposide, unless they're Japanese, then I do a renotecan um, platinum. But it, for right now, the main population, platinum toposide and switch maintenance to pemetrexid or olotinib is certainly feasible. In the adenocarcinomas, you always want to check for EGFR mutation and email for ALK. And I'm adding in now BRAF mutation, ROS1 mutation as well, and KRAS mutation.
Um, but right now, for the FDA-approved agents you have available, EGFR mutation, you want to get them an EGFR TKI in as soon as possible with erlotinib. Watch out for afatinib. That will have a role in this population in the future. And if they're eml 4 alk you get them crizotinib as fast as possible. And certainly afterwards, there's the LDK378 agent or HSP90 inhibitors. Um, and so certainly, you know, the one message I just want to leave you with is ultimately what we're going to be doing is looking at the genomics of the patient's tumor. And you see that very clearly for adenocarcinoma between the EGFR mutants, the email 4 alk ROS1 mutants, the BRAF mutants, PI3K mutants, and there's also the MET, which we didn't have time to go over today. But once you get that primary drug in with the target, Resistance often will require rebiopsying these patients. Find the on other oncogenic driver, the mechanism of resistance, and then target it. And then ultimately, one day, we're going to be using chemo, hopefully, in the salvage setting when they're third line, fourth line therapy. Okay, so this is hopefully our prospective future in the next couple of years. Okay, I'll stop here and take any questions.